How on earth do you work out how happy you are, whether you're happy at all, and why is it that people in Scandinavian countries are considered by some to be happier than anybody else? What do we need to be truly happy? You're watching Roundtable with me, David Foster. If the United Nations Happiness Report is to be believed, the happiest star in Finland, Nordic nations dominating the top ten, uh, which also includes Australia and New Zealand. So what do these countries have that others perhaps don't? And are they really that happy? The success and progress of a country is usually measured by economic growth, but is happiness a better metric? The UN's annual World Happiness Report consistently ranks Scandinavian countries among the world's happiest. And despite traditional indicators of economic strength being lower than in other countries, Northern Europeans seem content. But are they really? Could prioritizing happiness really improve the lives of citizens around the world? The UN Happiness Report ranks most of the world's countries according to a number of variables. Among them, GDP per capita, social support, healthy life expectancy, and perception of corruption. This year, Finland took the top spot, followed by Denmark, Norway, and then Iceland. I think it's the work-life balance. Uh, so we have a big um, safety net. So we get free education, free healthcare. We care about each other and uh, that is shown through our uh, entire welfare system. Well, our politics and economics, uh, I think we have the basic stuff is quite good in Finland. At the bottom of the table is Burundi, a country that has suffered ethnic cleansing, civil war and coup attempts. It's among six nations considered more unhappy than Syria. The world's largest economy, the United States, has dropped from 14th in 2017 to 18th in 2018. So a report like this is a message not only to poor countries, it's a message to rich countries also, like the United States, that have a kind of pure uh, money mentality and have let the social fabric fall apart. Critics of the index suggest that the way the results are compiled could be unbalanced and say some factors like high suicide rates in the happiest countries show that important information isn't being accounted for. Finland, happiest country in 2018 and regularly counted among the top five, has struggled in the past with high suicide rates. And a 2013 OECD report found that Iceland, Denmark, Sweden and Finland were among the top ten nations for antidepressant usage. Is happiness so easy to measure? Can the rest of the world learn from Northern European thinking by shifting the focus away from the financials and embracing a more socially democratic approach? I am very pleased to say that joining me at the round table we have Eugenio Proto, who specializes in behavioral economics at the University of Bristol. We have Edward Skidelsky, philosopher and co-author of How Much is Enough? Money and the good life. We have Frederica Roberts, a happiness and resilience specialist and co-founder of Resilience, Wellbeing, Success, and Paul Freitas, co-director of the Wellbeing Programme at the London School of Economics. Uh, I don't mean to be flip, but l let's start off by saying who's happy to be here. Hands up. <laughs> that is a start. That is, <laughs> that is a great start. Eugenia, let me ask you, before we come to the definition of happiness, and I'd like you yeah. to do that a bit differently, you think these sort of studies do show how happy people are, whereas a lot of people are sort of saying it's impossible. It's an important signal, clearly. They, it's a very noisy signal, it's a very noisy one, but it's an important signal which carries some information. Which well, what, what information in particular? About people's well-being, welfare. I mean, up to now, welfare has been measured mostly, or still measured mostly by GDP, and clearly everybody knows that this is a not good measure, not a yeah. comprehensive measure. Happiness can, can complement this measure in many in many respects. It's, it's, it's subjective well-being. How you feel? How you feel with your life? Okay. And I think it carries some information because I think people are able to say what how they feel. Edward, you, you I know you don't think 
this is a good way of doing it, that you can't really quantify it this way. So let me ask you, instead of you telling me that, how you would define happiness. You're the philosopher. Well, it, it depends very much what language you're using, of course. Um, and the English word happy means one thing. Its equivalent in other languages may mean something quite different. OK, so it's how do you define you happiness as we would do at this table? Let well, us say, for the benefit of this okay, programme. Well, I mean, the, um, the World Happiness Report uh, doesn't actually mention happiness. I believe it asks you to put yourself on a scale of 1 to 10 uh, with the very best life you can imagine at the top and the very worst life you can imagine at the bottom. So the word happiness isn't actually in the question that's put to people. So. OK, um, an obscure answer, I think, from the <laughs> philosopher, which is what we, what we might expect. You two, to some extent, <laughs> both teach happiness. Let me come to you first of all, Paul, because yours is a very interesting story, Frederica. But, but you are preparing students to take programmes of well-being mm -hmm. out into the community and perhaps into government departments mm -hmm. to teach people how mm -hmm. perhaps they can get more out of their lives. Yes, we're very much in favour of trying to base our policies and our view of government on the notion that what it is about is to improve the well-being of the population. Uh, and the well-being of the population is always very difficult to measure, but the best measures we have do have to do with this kind of evaluation with life as a whole. Uh, and uh, as uh, Mrs. Skidelsky has said, um, which is true, the World Happiness Import, uh, Report, in fact, measures something closer to life satisfaction, which is, you know, how do you feel about life as a whole, which is also the way that we here in Britain measure it. So the first measure of the Office of National Statistic on well-being is life satisfaction. How would you evaluate life as a whole? Uh, and that is something you can do in, in any real language, right? Uh, and so that is something that does translate across cultures, which is just, well, if you'd have to summarize your life, how are you doing? Um, and we think that this is a very sensible way to think of how people's lives are and something that government can strive to make better. They don't at the moment, then? No. no nowhere yet in the world. Uh, but more and more countries are getting to be more and more serious about it. So um, Bhutan, of course, has sort of had the Ministry of Happiness uh, for a long time. Gross national happiness has been part of their national psyche. Uh, but closer to home, France and Italy have sort of mandated some notion of evaluations of new policies on the basis of well-being. Uh, and in Britain, too, uh, David Cameron was, of course, a great champion. Gus O'Donnell has been a champion. And for over two centuries, uh, London has been a place where we've had a, a utilitarian philosophy that this is really what government should be about. And we're starting to take it more seriously. Do, do jump in at any point if you agree or disagree with what's being said, because <laughs> I'm just trying to get everybody's little story at the moment. Frederica, you were a teacher. Yeah. Um, I think you found it very stressful. I did. I, in the yes. end. And uh, through a process of elimination, different jobs here and there, you decided in the end that you could teach people how to... Let's, let's perhaps lose the word happiness in every <laughs> sentence. Yeah. Feel better about themselves. Mm -hmm. Yes, feel better about their lives and, and, and lead good lives. And I think um, that's where what Edward was saying about what words we use and the definitions that we use of happiness. Happiness is perhaps a very simplistic term, but really if you think in terms of um, living a good life, which then isn't just about you either, it's about the society that you live in and the world that you live in, then I, I certainly uh, subscribe to that kind of notion of happiness of actually how can we teach and in my case particularly children from primary school all the way through until they leave school to to actually work on on that well-being and on that sense of of living a good life which includes a, a life that is good not just for yourself but for because you do go into you. schools now even though I you're not a teacher schools, and, you, and yes. you, you take these children from the ages what of it t nine ten About eight we start okay yes. right the way up to 17 18 yeah. and if you had one core message to them uh, what would it be? I know they're all individual. <laughs> what would it be? There are lots of different components of, of this, this thing that we call happiness or the good life, but um, more and more I'm looking at, at the research and the evidence that actually uh, points to, to the fabric of society and human relationships and the connections we have with other people. And that's really um, at the core of a lot of, of, of what the good life is. So if you're thinking in terms of the work that we're doing with children, and particularly in a, in a society where we are seeing more and more children and kind of with, with their heads buried in their phones and on their computers, etc. 
Um, it's about bringing them back out of that into how do you connect in, in reality with people? How do you make those contact? And, and it can be the real simple things like making eye contact with somebody when you're having a conversation with them um, to, to actually how to listen to somebody proactively and, and really take in what they're saying to you rather than just waiting. You, you mentioned family and in. connections. Mm. The, the, the summary of this UN happi mm. happiness report, let's call it that, um, it says happiness bulge, the happiness bulge in Latin America is found mm -hmm. to depend on the greater warmth of family and other social relationships. Mm -hmm. And we've sort of lost that, haven't we? In, in, in pursuing happiness in one particular direction, in other words, interconnectivity, etc., mm -hmm. etc., et we, we've lo lost that ability to, commit, to, to relate. Possibly, yeah. I, I think human connections are terribly important, but they're important in themselves and not because of the effect that they have on people's mental states. Um, I, I think, um, I mean, the, the trouble with self-reports as a measure of well-being is that, um, I mean, what, what's really important in life is to do the things that you're passionate about and do them well. Um, you know, that you feel happy as a result of that is a nice add-on extra, but that shouldn't be your primary goal in life. Well, the Americans, back in whatever year it was, the Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness was, was a right. Yeah, I think that was their main, uh, on the Constitution, it says the pursuit of oh, happiness. But I just want to say something about Latin America, which is, and comparing Latin America with Scandinavian country, which normally tops there. For example, if you look at Latin America, effectively, their driver of happiness is social connection, family, and so on. While if you look at the Scandinavian country, probably is the state, is the welfare state. So there are two different models of, uh, of, uh, of developing well-being. One is more traditional, the one of developing of Latin American country. The other one is a bit more, let's say, modern, which is the one um, uh, Paul was mentioned before, which is the welfare state enters and tries to take care of people. Okay, there are two main drivers, and they have both an effect of... But, but one, one thing they have in common is that both of them help alleviate worry. Absolutely. It's caring. Okay, caring. Yeah. Yeah, and the question is, would you like the state caring for you or your next of kin uh, caring for you? And uh, the, actual, the answer is not obvious to me. No. It's a feeling of connection that, yeah. Uh, yeah. that both uh, attain. Exactly. Right? Yeah. I mean, Costa Rica is very close to Finland in terms of the happiest country of the world. Yeah. The world Happiness Report always finds it difficult to put it next to the Scandinavian countries, but <laughs> it does score equally well, and this is because of very warm relationships. Absolutely, yeah. uh, and it's probably cheaper, you see. It, it is, but um, it, it, of course uh, it's almost inevitable that we go to a more state system as we have now in Britain, uh, because the state has to take over in the areas of education, okay. uh, in the areas of health, uh, also a lot of uh, modern infrastructure means that economies generate a large nation state, and so the Latin American model to a certain extent is transitory, right? It, it will become more like Scandinavian models if, if yeah. they're lucky. And, and to go back to one of the previous points that you made, David, uh, the UK is actually doing very well. I mean, it's, it's measured life satisfaction, happiness levels have really been increasing the last 10, 15 mm. years. And so I wouldn't say we, we've lost, we're regaining it. And, and are we regaining it through a process of osmosis or because somebody's put their finger on it? I think partially uh, British society is starting to give itself permission again to be happy. I think that there, there is a process to which positive psychology and the care for the mental health of individuals and for the community is starting to be acceptable. Uh, you, you have members of the royal family who dare to cry on television and not be afraid to show emotions. Um, but you also have now the improved access to psychiatric therapies whereby we recognize that lots of people are depressed and anxious and we feel this is something we can and should do something about. And that would, would have not yeah, been true in. 50 years ago. Yeah, but this is a period in which funding for social services has been mm -hmm. slashed, mm -hmm. yet happiness has risen. So how, how would you explain that paradox? Um, I, I will give you a simple statistic, uh, which is that um, labor force participation has never been higher now. And if we talk about the number one reason why many uh, adults of our age feel connected, it's via their jobs. That's where they, they meet colleagues. It's how they, they feel they have a place in society. And so one of the big reasons why levels of life satisfaction are now higher, probably, than they were 10 years ago, is because most people have a job. Now let's ask Frederica how, how you approach. I asked you for one thing mm. in particular, and I, I guess it was a silly question, but it was designed <laughs> to, to bring out the yeah. fact that it is multi so many different yeah, facets, absolutely. multifaceted. 
what do you go in and try and show these children that they can beat? In other words, what are the main problems they have that don't lead to their well-being? Problems that um, children are having, um, one is uh, a lot of their parents and teachers report that they're lacking in resilience, so um, they do badly in a test and it's the end of the world and that's kind of a reflection on their whole being rather than just something that has happened on, in one instance. Um, they are, I think, a lot more aware of things that are happening around them than, than perhaps even our generation ever was in, in terms of everything is there on the internet. They know about... Everything what, and nothing. <laughs> everything and nothing, but they are aware of, of, of poverty, of wars, and yeah. from a much, much earlier age. And then there's a, the, there's the usual stuff that happens, you know, breakdown of families, new families forming, friendships, all the usual stresses that children have always had, and, and that's absolutely yeah. normal. Um, what we are perhaps seeing is that to some extent and for whatever reason, some children are finding it harder to cope with everyday stresses. And so what, what we go in and do is we, we help them kind of, to some extent, put it into perspective as well, uh, but also um, understand that it's okay to, to fail and that you can pick yourself back up and that failure is part of life's journey and part of what, how you learn to become more resilient. You see, because what, what's happening, I think, an awful lot of the time is people are looking at these virtual lives mm -hmm. of their friends or their acquaintances and thinking everybody's happier than I am, everybody's having a better life than I am, whereas in fact that may be a facade as well. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you put that genie back in the bottle? I mean, what, what do you do with that? Okay, first of all, I'd like to just point it out. Is UK is nice, but I think Paul gave a bit too rosy figure of, of UK in a sense. <laughs> I, I, I agree Particularly with when the snow is as deep as it is <laughs> in the picture behind me. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I, th I, think, I think, and I, I'll get back to your point as well, uh, UK can do a lot of better than what it does, if you, especially if you compare with uh, Scandinavian country. And one reason why UK people could be happier is because there is too much high level of inequality in the UK and in the US. Okay, and the levels of unemployment at the moment are very low. Yeah, unemployment but inequality is, is, is inequality, huge. Okay. So inequality is, is yep. really, I mean, unemployment is, is true, but very low wage. So inequality is still very high in the UK, it's higher than the rest of Europe and is close to the United States. And this generates frustration because parents, some parents cannot send their kids to the best school, okay, or some people cannot afford the best level of a health uh, system because there is this post-code lottery. All this inequality generates frustration. But that's life, isn't it? It's life, but in the UK, in the in the Scandinavian country, uh, they manage to do something about that. They have a much lower yeah. level of inequality. Yeah, I, I agree. I think excess inequality is a blight mm -hmm. because it uh, damages social cohesion. Sure. It leads to arrogance on the one side, envy on the other. But I think you can make that case without mentioning happiness. I mean, these are just objectively bad things for society. Absolutely. You, don't, you don't need to add, and it makes people but unhappy. But, why you I, I, why but I, I disagree uh, with that. Yeah. Um, I mean, we, we, we only care about inequality, and I actually agree. Inequality is, is too high, and we should do something about it. Um, but we care about it because it makes people feel bad. If yeah. you say, well, it's they are jealous, that is a feeling that you then care so, about. So if you say it's bad because of jealousy, oh, yeah. well... Okay, okay, you are invoking can, a feeling can, can of I, the reason I, we no, care about Can I just ask, if, if you were able to give people pills mm -hmm. to make them feel less bad about it, would that make it okay? Uh, well, I mean, I, I wouldn't be against uh, pills that make people uh, happier. But, if they made, made all only, people happy with their but, lot. But, but, but only if it's sustainable, right? And we give people many pills to okay. sort of be healthy. Let, let, let's, take, let's take the mother's little helpers ones. out of this. Well, no, no, they're, 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 they're very relevant. Just for the basis of this conversation, because how do you, them all the time how do you teach people to be happy? Is it something that's innate? Is it something that you can learn? It's mm -hmm. both. It's both. So um, certainly um, some of the research that I've looked at would indicate that um, about half of sort of our happiness set level is, is based on genetics and there is a certain genetic element in that but equally... You're either a glass half full, yes, half empty. Th yeah. There's a One kind of, of set yeah, level yeah, yeah. but equally um, circumstances account for about 10% of, of, of how happy or unhappy we are and, and then there's this whopping big 40% and you can argue about the percentages but ultimately there is this big amount where we can actually deliberately do things um, to be happier and again it's not just about this notion of selfish happiness but about looking at the people around you and and leading a better life and I think this is when we're looking at these conversations that we're having you know um, should we give people pills to just make it better because they're living in a dreadful place and situation well no I think we should 
get them to work on making the place better. And I think that's where okay. actually being unhappy is a good thing. I wasn't trying to, to, to quiet you down about that. I was just <laughs> trying to get on to a slightly yeah. different element okay. of it. Can I, can I put this to you? Yeah. yeah. This is the wonderfully named mm. Psychonomic Bulletin and Review says, all the studies have confirmed the scientist's suspicion. The harder we try to make ourselves happy, the more we feel like we don't have enough time to do it. And the more we feel that time is scarce, the unhappier <laughs> we become. So we yeah. should just accept our lot rather than no, no, trying no, to no, find a way to no, be no, happy. No, no. That, that's no, too difficult. No, absolutely not. No, I, th I think um, I mean, the goal of education should not be to make people happy. It should be to make them intensely dissatisfied with their lives and circumstances as they are so that they try to improve them. Um, what rather a horrible than... thought. <laughs> no, no, that's absolutely... What a horrible thought. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> My God. No, no, what, no, no, one of the... 18th one of the... century, <laughs> you know, we, we should all suffer and this is the way well, to handle it. No, you should be dissatisfied. You should be dissatisfied. You should be dissatisfied. There's a difference your... between yeah. being unhappy yeah. and not being content. Yeah. Now, not being content means you, you would like to improve things, but happiness is a slightly more invisible. Well, you know, aspirations, probably, let, let me put it in this, in this terms. Low aspiration might mean happiness, OK? If somebody aspires very low, it's easy to achieve what you want and then satisfy. That's not a nice way to achieve happiness, OK? And that, so you need to high aspiration, and aspiration might generate some unhappiness, which is a bit a different way of saying what you, you were saying. That's fine. But you see, overall, when you ask somebody to evaluate his life, he has factor in all these things, you see. That's why it's good uh, these indexes are good, because it, it's a measure which is, if you want, is not a measure by one thing. It's a measure which put together a lot of interesting things and generates one index, which more or less you can, you, you can learn from it. Otherwise, you see, you have to uh, split the society in. Is the society delivering right aspiration? Is the society delivering low inequality? Is the society delivering good education? It's becoming too complicated. Well, Life satisfaction, life evaluation, mm -hmm. can you know can incorporate everything. Do jump in and, and take yeah. on what Edward says. Well, you, yeah. I, I, I will paraphrase very badly. He effectively said, "You've got to be miserable to become happy." <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know you know, but, but, but empirically, but that's not true. That? What if children well, think that? Well, actually, I don't. Uh, excuse I don't me, entirely <laughs> disagree with Edward in that respect. That actually, yes, to some extent, and and when I teach children about the importance of positive emotions and how they can lead to flourishing and, and how it's really important to, to do things that enable us to feel positive emotions. I also tell them that actually there is no such thing as a bad or negative emotion and actually it's really important that we're able to feel anger and frustration because if we're able to feel angry at a situation then we're able to, to strive to making it better and to change it. So I, I absolutely agree with that element but that then in itself means that we are actually inherently strong striving to be happier or to achieve a better life or whichever vocabulary you want to, to use to describe it. So actually that is still leading to this kind of desire for a better life for ourselves. Are, 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 are there inherently but, unhappy folks around who you can't change? But, but David, I mean this, this, this is a nonsense. None of us want our own kids to be unhappy. No. I don't know a single parent who says I must have an unhappy kid <laughs> because then later on in life they'll strive for happiness. <laughs> I, I, I mean being facetious is, yeah. I know such, you, your, your point was this is people such should always nonsense. try to improve. And, yeah. uh, and, and furthermore, what we know is that happier children also do better in exams. Absolutely. They yeah. live longer. They're healthier. I mean, there is no sense in which an unhappy child is, is better off than a happier child. I mean, that's okay. just I think you're being nonsense. unfairly maligned here. <laughs> so I'm, 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 not, I'm, I'm not giving you the last chance. I'm not, I'm not promoting unhappiness. And of course, I, I don't want my you children were. to be unhappy. You, no, were. No, you said you want them to be miserable. <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't. They, they strive in life. No. It's, it's untrue no. and it's a horrible thing. Unhappy no, no, because no. he has to have the last no. word at yeah. the moment he's not. I, I'd like them to do whatever they do very well. Yeah. Um, and in order to do something well, you have to be very frustrated with yourself and with your circumstances oh. for a lot of the time. A total um, nonsense. I, no, it's absolutely total true. I, I don't if you look quite, at the, bi the, bi look at the biography of any person who's really achieved something, <laughs> no. you'll find... This, uh, this has been debunked decades ago. No, this no, is not but, true. But be careful, because if you are frustrated all your life, OK, that, that's not right. OK, if you are frustrated one little bit of your life, and that helps you to achieve what you want, and then finally you get satisfied, well, it's good, you see. Uh, you cannot be frustrated all the time. Otherwise, it doesn't work, really. It doesn't work while you are living. You cannot frustrate all the time. Okay. Mm -hmm. j j uh, uh, just, uh, just exactly. more, small, a small, also small statistic. Finland is the happiest country in, in the world yeah. nowadays. Yeah. 
it also, I think, is also the most innovative in terms of patent per person. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's, it's an extremely innovative country in terms of uh, mm -hmm. technological innovation, design, and so on. So, you know, uh, despite the fact that they are happy, they're also innovative. So. And happiness mm -hmm. does foster creativity, absolutely. Uh, it's it's yeah. an essential. It does. It, it's good. And, and, and I think it's, it's important to go to the point where we can make people happy, right? We, we now know many things that we can <coughs> give people, right? We can put in more attention to their mental health, and this is something teachable. Um, mm. But one of the best things to come out of the recent World Happiness Report... You're going to have to be awfully quick. ...is the knowledge that if you go to a happier country, you adapt to its happiness level. You take on the good happy habits of happy countries. So we can teach happiness. You just put someone in a happy uh, or group and they become happier. you become incredibly frustrated that you have to leave a happy country <laughs> and go back to the one uh, where you're welcome. Listen, I do apologise if you felt like you were being a no. bit... <laughs> you're not unhappy, are you? No, no, no. no. Thank no. you. Thank no. you all very much indeed and uh, look we can end this program simply by quoting uh, one of the greatest entertainers i think uh, this country's ever had a man we lost last week ken dodd happiness happiness the greatest gift that i possess i hope you've enjoyed the program from me david foster and the round table team goodbye for now hope to have your company next time <laughs>